Bienvenidos. Welcome again for those of you who are just joining us um, now. I'm Amari Salanis Hipero, the Director of Forestry at Hispanic Access Foundation, and welcome to the Nuestros Bosques webinar. Si usted hace hacer la información en español, make sure to click español. Uh, haga click en español que aparece en bajo de la pantalla. We'll wait a couple minutes for um, others to join as well. Welcome, welcome everyone. The room is getting filled. Boa tarde a todos. Bienvenidos. Les recordamos, si quieren escuchar la presentación en español, um, por favor, pueden seleccionar el botón que dice español, que aparece en, en la parte baja de la pantalla. Esta presentación también está disponible en español. Muchísimas gracias uh, para, para su participación. Okay, thank you everyone. We're about to get started. Again, my name is Amari Salanisi Pero, the Director of Forestry at Hispanic Access Foundation. I welcome you to the Nuestros Bosques webinar. For any questions that you might have throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A feature and we will get to them at the end during the Q&A session. Now, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Maite Arce, Hispanic Access Foundation's president and CEO, who will provide some opening remarks. Maite. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Amaris. I really appreciate this exciting um, moment to be able to share in, about Hispanic Access and welcome to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, thank you. We are so excited to have you. And I just wanted to um, share that not only are we very excited, but we are also, um, this is an incredibly historic moment um, that we, and we are here with an exceptional team to be able to share this opportunity with all of you. Um, I am the president and CEO of Hispanic Access Foundation. I'm calling in from Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC. Um, Hispanic Access and our team, we are guide, we have these wonderful uh, guiding principles that are core to the work that we do. And the work that we do is to catapult our Latino community into action by providing leaders with access capacity and the belief to create big change. And so we know um, there's leadership in communities. You are um, in a perfect example of this and you understand and have a very unique understanding of the needs of your communities. We understand that, but we also know we need each other and we need to help support each other in accessing resources and opportunities and technical support. And that's why we're here today uh, to talk about this our, this resource opportunity. Um, and, you know, the things that, um, you know, one of the things, or I would say the things that makes Hispanic Access Foundation very unique is we have um, a long history of engagement with trusted partners for the community. We provide tools, resources, and opportunities in bilingual format 
to help develop the capacity of leaders. Um, we secure funding to advance work on community issues. And we also um, have extensive trust-based relationships in communities throughout the United States and Puerto Rico. And we together access hard to reach communities with that commitment to, um, to serve our communities in, um, with excellence. And our guarantee to our community and to you in this process of offering this new grant opportunity is to deliver results with quality, nimbleness, y corazón. Um, the Nuestros Bosques Initiative, um, you know, you might say, well, why Hispanic Access? Why is Hispanic Access involved in this? And um, we, it's a, as I mentioned, a very historic opportunity um, to get uh, size, large sized resources to communities um, quickly where they're needed the most. And uh, the Forest Service and, and our government understands these resources are necessary, they're needed on the ground. And often the communities who need these resources the most um, don't gain access to these resources. And, I, and that is why they asked us to become a national partner is because we have the relationships, we have um, trusted relationships and offer technical support as, as well. And we have been, um, and so this work of um, helping to green our communities is incredibly important and um, and you are incredibly important in leading this work for your community. And so we wanna help you to be successful in doing that. And um, so we're really happy that you are here to learn. Um, it matters very much because this um, these resources um, are uh, for expanding urban canopy and offers communities relief in shade from extreme heat. So we know many of your communities are experiencing heat and mostly it's our, our underserved communities or um, who, who experience that in the worst way. It's also um, why it matters to us is because of mental health. Through access to nature, we know um, nature can promote a healthy well-being for individuals and families and kids. We also know um, there's an opportunity through these resources for workforce development by providing paid opportunities um, that can expand workforce opportunities and grow urban tree canopy. And it can also strengthen your organizations and experience and connection and partnerships. Um, so we're really thrilled um, that this day is here. And um, I just wanted to say it's um, an important and historic time. We want to work together to make sure this these resources reach um, the communities who often don't have these resources available to you. And so our goal is to make this as um, clear of a process and, and uh, smooth of a process as possible. And we've got amazing people to help support you in providing that clarity and the support as you, um, once you decide if you're going to apply. Uh, so I wanted to um, share lastly that, um, you know, these resources, our hope is will really, you know, reach um, communities that are serving um, our Hispanic communities, indigenous communities, um, other communities who, again, are not the traditional applicants or partners of the Forest Service. We want to expand their partnerships and your partnerships so that this work can really impact the communities um, that often are the most impacted by heat and, and other um, climate impacts. Thank you so much, Amaris, and, and I'm excited to, to learn with you um, about this opportunity today and to help support with any questions. I'll turn it over to you, Amaris. Thank you, Maite. At this time, I would also like to introduce you to the team members of the Forestry Department at Hispanic Access Foundation. 
We have Aglenda Gonzalez, which is our program manager, Marilyn Science, Grant Portfolio Associate, Juliana Rodriguez, Grant Portfolio Associate, and Naomi Rodriguez, Administrative Associate. You will be hearing from the team members shortly, um, but I would like to uh, um, invite you all <laughs> to introduce yourselves on, on chat if you would like. Please add your name if you haven't already um, introduced yourself, your organization, and how about something about a tree? It could be your favorite tree. It's okay if you don't know uh, the names of the trees and their species. It could be the leaf color that you like, a tree that you grew up with, a tree that needs care near your home. So for example, I grew up in an apartment building in Chicago and there was a cherry tree at the building next door. I always wondered why it didn't look like the cherries at the grocery store. Um, so I, again, please invite you all to introduce yourselves on chat if you haven't already and share something about a tree. Thank you for those of you participating. It's a very lovely to see some of your responses and get to know um, more about you and the community that we have on this webinar today. Earlier, we heard from Maite in her opening remarks, the importance of why this matters. I want to reiterate some of these points um, as you are considering applying for this opportunity and including that in your proposal. I want to start by doing some grounding, rooting, if you will, as to why this funding opportunity matters. In support of the 10-year Urban Forestry Action Plan and state forest action plans, we are supporting the expansion of the urban canopy. As we heard earlier, efforts to support urban, urban forestry are helping to address the disproportionate extreme heat we see in our communities. I myself have been involved in um, some of this heat research. In July of last year was the hot, one of the hottest months on record across the nation. And um, we know that the tree canopy cover can actually reduce temperatures 11 to 19 degrees Fahrenheit. Not only that, but trees will also provide support for climate resiliency, droughts, floods, insects, diseases, and natural disasters that we are facing even as last weekend. And I don't have to tell you all this, but we know how important access to nature is both to your physical and mental health. But there are other reasons beyond these two points um, on these slides of why this matters. There's real economic um, hardships in our community to pay energy bills and a, a planting trees will help lower these costs. There's environmental justice reasons to improve air quality, food justice if you plant fruit trees or food forests, and just overall inequities of access to green spaces. But I, I, I want to stress the importance of not being passive participants in all of this. Why? The why is really including you in the decision making to improve conditions locally and even regionally. Finally, um, I also want to mention that the benefit of trees is not always human centered, but to consider an ecosystem approach for wildlife habitat, for example. Moreover, it should be a reciprocal relationship with trees for the future. So know your why and get to know our tree relatives, nuestros bosques, our forests. I want to now um, announce a little bit more about um, this exciting um, opportunity, this significant milestone. 
Oh, there is a funding opportunity of over 10 million in funding. And we have dedicated reserve funds for faith-based organizations, which is meaningful to Hispanic Access Foundation, and also dedicating some funds to additional strategic local investments. So Hispanic Access Foundation, as a, as a national pass-through partner, received a $25 million award from the United States Forest Service. So Nuestros Bosques IRA initiative, the broader initiative, is promoting Justice 40 and America the Beautiful Peace in commitment to the intent of the Forest Service and the Inflation Reduction Act. 80% of funds will flow directly to disadvantaged communities. As you notice, we have um, um, award amounts as well. Um, we are excited about the ability to have award amounts ranging from 50,000 to 1 million. I do wanna point out, this is a reimbursement grant due to the subaward via a federal government grant. And so what that means is organizations should have um, funds all, um, all ready to pay for expenses. And the timeline for disbursement will be 45 days after an approved invoice. It's important to consider um, your um, financial uh, cap capacity, your organizational capacity when applying. We'll explain that a little bit later. Um, and we would love to know if you, when you apply, if your project can be scaled up or scaled down. We really were thoughtful in considering um, capacity, being able to set up uh, you up for success, and also being able to make big change, the impact that Maite described earlier. I'll go over um, eligibility as well. Um, there, there is um, that significant support of organizations that are smaller and more grassroots in nature, especially those that are serving disadvantaged communities. So we are supporting projects across the United States, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. That includes faith-based organizations with nonprofit status, community-based organizations that are also nonprofits, and federally recognized tribes, Alaska Native corporations slash villages, and tribal organizations. I mentioned that uh, there is a special emphasis on projects to deliver benefits to disadvantaged communities. And these are defined by census information and, and maps using designated tools described in the request for proposals explained later in this presentation. Any of the above may partner with a local government to apply and or additional entities that fall within the criteria. At Hispanic Access, we listen to the community first and have been doing environmental work for a long time because the community identified this need. We have an equitable approach. We have many of you on the webinar today and earlier ideas related to urban forestry and indigenous permaculture as well. We also know that projects can take time. So this funding opportunity includes the ability for you to apply to nearly three years for a grant duration of a project. There is also no matching requirement. And additionally, I want to point out that our application criteria considers an asset-based approach, values collaboration, and the potential impact, not just for human and environmental health, but also building capacity for leadership and potentially strengthening networks. An equitable approach was also considered knowing that there's a spectrum of engagement in urban forestry. And how do we engage folks in all phases of, the, of that if they may or not be engaged in tree planting? On that note, I will hand it off to my colleague, Glenda. 
Thank you, Amaris, um, and thank you, Maite, for that wonderful introduction. Um, today, I'm excited to share with you the three program goals for urban forestry that can truly transform your community. So whether you're just starting a project or looking to enhance an existing one, there are several key areas where you can make a significant impact. So let's start with the first goal, which is urban and community forestry planning. This is a comprehensive approach that goes beyond just planting trees. It's about creating a long-term vision for your urban forest. So what are some of the activities that can be involved? Well, it might include developing an urban forest master plan, conducting a comprehensive tree inventory, or establishing a tree protection ordinance. But it's not just about the trees themselves. It's also about collaboration across sectors. And we're talking about working hand in hand with urban planners, engineers, educators, your municipality, and public health officials. This is really an interdisciplinary approach that allows you to share skills, set meaningful goals, and create holistic plans that benefit your entire community. It's also about tapping into the wealth of expertise. You can collaborate with local urban forestry experts who understand the unique environmental conditions in your community. You may consult with indigenous permaculture advisors who are experts in drawing on traditional ecological knowledge. And you can also work alongside ISA certified professionals, foresters and arborists who bring specialized technical knowledge to the table. All of these partnerships and collaborations provide crucial technical assistance and support for your project. And they ensure that your urban forestry initiatives are not only ambitious, but also grounded in expert knowledge and best practices. So then we can go into our second goal, which is tree planting and maintenance. And this is really where a project can take root. Um, first, when you're selecting trees, we really want you to think native and climate adapted. You're not just adding a splash of green here and there to the cityscape. You're really cultivating a resilient urban forest that can withstand the challenges of our changing environment for the, our benefit and for the benefit of the local wildlife. But also keep in mind that when plant, planting that, that planting is just the beginning. Your trees are going to need ongoing care to thrive. And that's why a solid maintenance plan is crucial. So imagine this as like the health plan for your urban forest. You're gonna want regular checkups in the form of pruning, watering. You're gonna to wanna to be able to fight off invasive species that may threaten your trees. And you wanna be able to keep an eye out for potential hazards. A maintenance plan may also include the removal of hazardous trees in your community. And it's all really about keeping a part of a nurtured and healthy, safe urban canopy. And then there's also really special, something really special to consider here, the heritage connection to trees. When you plant native species, you're not just improving the environment, you're really writing a new chapter in our ancient story. These trees can be living links to the cultural and historical roots of your community. They're not just plants, they're storytellers, connecting us to the land and its history. So remember when you're planning your tree planting and maintenance, you're not just growing trees, you're cultivating resilience, enhancing and protecting nature, preserving heritage and creating a lasting, a lasting legacy for your community. And we'll go on to the, yes, the third one. So now we can talk about the third goal, which is community engagement. Your project can really be a powerful tool for improving community mental health promoting equitable access to nature, especially in disadvantaged communities. And here are a few examples of how you could foster that engagement. You can involve individuals in planning, planting, and management activities. You can host community planting days or workshops on tree care. You can also engage local groups like schools and neighborhood associations, and they can become really powerful advocates for your project. You can also partner with organizations serving disadvantaged communities. They can help ensure your efforts align with local needs. The goal here is really to transform community members from passive beneficiaries to active participants. The approach not only ensures your project reflects community needs, but also builds local capacity for ongoing forest care. In conclusion, 
whether you're focusing on planning, planting maintenance, or community engagement, or a combination of all three, remember that urban forestry is about more than just planting trees. It's about creating healthier, more resilient, and more engaged communities. Your project really has the power to improve mental health, promote equity, preserve cultural heritage, and foster a deep connection between people and nature. And by integrating these elements, you're not just growing an urban forest, you're growing a more vibrant, sustainable, and connected community. And so I encourage each of you to think about how you can incorporate these ideas into your project. Start where you can, and remember that every plan made, every tree planted, and every community member engaged is a step towards a greener, healthier future. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to my colleague, Marilyn. Alrighty, hopefully everyone can hear me. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marilyn Sines, Grant Portfolio Associate here at Hispanic Access Foundation. And I'm excited and have the honor to introduce a active example from a grantee under our portfolio now. Um, and really uh, answer some questions or some doubts that you might have at this time as to what a project looks like, some activities that can be included in your project, and we'll dive into some best practices um, to really support a successful project, but also a strong proposal when ready to apply. So Sombra in the Desert um, stands for Sonoran Mesquite Barrier Restoration Alliance. So this project is conducted within the Tucson, Arizona region. And this project is led by the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona. So although this project is led by the Community Food Bank, it is in partnership with 12 local organizations, including two indigenous partners. So we're, we're so blessed to have a um, project that exemplifies such a grand collaborative capacity um, and really reaching out and weaving in knowledge and wisdom from so many organizations. Um, in addition to uh, reaching environmentally, uh, multiple neighborhoods as well as uh, serving diverse groups of community members. Some of the activities that they're engaging in is to build community capacity. So through bilingual on-site trainings, inviting communities to learn and practice urban forestry skills through live demonstrations from a certified arborist. So one-on-one -on -one, live right in front of them, they're really learning how to care for trees, learn about them, and really be uh, you know, confident in being environmental stewards in the future. So through uh, bilingual, bilingual, sorry, on-site trainings, as well as events, they're hoping to engage 300 community members. Now, 300 community members, not just one event, but throughout their entire project timeline. Um, and really, their, their greatest um, mission is for community members to have the confidence to become environmental stewards, learn about trees, and also apply what they learn. So they're, they're uh, maintaining and caring for trees in their neighborhoods and for future generations to benefit as well. Another huge component of their project is, of course, growing and planting 11,000 native mesquite trees throughout the entire process of their project timeline. So planting in both private and public uh, properties. Um, and then as well, a huge component of that requirement within the grant is having a letters of support. So when you're working with private property owners, as well as your local organizations involved in your project, we want to make sure we have those letters of support, not only, only acknowledging the support that they'll be involved in with the leading organization driving the project to success, but also the responsibilities or accountabilities that the organization will have within the project to drive towards success as well. In the note of requirements, I want to make sure to drive into some best practices of how to really build and develop a successful project. Um, so some essential key po components to really think about is your community needs. <clears throat> so Sombra is located in Arizona. So they're really thinking about heat vulnerable communities, Arizona being one of the most 
hottest regions in the United States, right? Reaching 112 degrees and within the past couple of years have broken those records. So what exactly do they need to combat, you know, heat vulnerable communities? And trees came into the picture. So providing that shade, as well as lowering the temperatures even to 10 degrees in some areas. So really engaging Latino communities and uh, disadvantaged communities into engaging into nature and really having that enjoyment and benefit in green spaces. Another major component is to plan project sustainability in advance. This is a huge component in the grant and really wanting to drive success for projects and applicants as well. So questions like who will care for trees after the project, who is knowledgeable in your team right now to plant the trees, or if this will be a contractual service that will be being incorporated um, financially in your project as well as learning about the trees in your areas. A huge component is making sure that the trees are native and climate resilient, right? So trees planted in Arizona might not actually be the trees planted in the Eastern side of the United States, right? So really learning about native trees and also what they need, um, their watering schedule, um, if they're needing care or irrigation within one year or up to three years, who will conduct um, that maintenance as well as if it's a contractual service, making sure sure that uh, maintenance is conducted during the project timeline as well as beyond the project timeline. So we'll dive into some tools and resources available to all applicants. These resources will really help applicants build a successful proposal and strong one as well. So I'll go through uh, some of these and really tackle some key components that could really help bring your proposal to life. Budget template. Uh, budget template is a resource great to utilize to really lay out a big picture of your budget. Each category, sorry, each expense has to be within a category and each expense um, is really important to describe per unit cost for each expense. We really wanna make sure one, funds are accountable for, but two, also let the reviewers or um, Hispanic Access know what the organization is hopefully wanting to implement funds towards. Project plan template. The project plan template is a project plan in a timeline format. So it allows us to really see the project uh, described in milestones or in activities throughout your project timeline. So reminder, uh, the grant can be within a three-year timeline, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be a one year, one and a half or two. So the project plan template allows us to see the project within its entirety and then how each milestone and activity and when it's being conducted. The tree planting tracking template is a resource to help applicants introduce some of the potential trees that we'll be planting. So listing potential tree species already in the template, as well as how many trees for each species and then how many trees total, as well as some key details we hopefully can uh, see in the template is the caliper size for the trees, as well as the potential locations for planting, right? Uh, you, you know, specifically some organizations might not plant just in one particular place, it will be in, in different areas. So we wanna make sure we have that laid out and seen um, completely in one area. Census track template uh, is a great resource to list the required census track ID numbers for the potential planting or activity locations. Um, so the track ID numbers are located in the required tools, um, but it allows us to see if you're planting in multiple locations side by side as to where they're planting and the track ID numbers right there available. Last but not least, some technical assistance available to applicants. We are excited here at Hispanic Access to partner with the USDA Forest Service to offer the Community Navigator Program. The Community Navigator Program helps local leaders build climate resilience within their communities by finding accessible grant funding and capacity building support. So if your organization seems like um, technical assistance might be needed, please visit our Hispanic Access Navigator website for more information. Um, I hope this example and best practices uh, as well as resources provide support and confidence in not only submitting a timely proposal, but know the difference and impact that can be done in your local community. Um, so I'm excited to introduce uh, my fellow colleague, Naomi, who will go through the application process. Hello, everyone. Um, I will, let me introduce myself. My name is Naomi Rodriguez. 
I am the administrative associate here on the forestry team. And um, very quickly would like to tell you all that the RFP has been launched and ready to go. Um, so we're asking those to apply to head over and visit hispanicaccess.org forward slash trees, um, where you will be find well, you will find all of the resources to help uplift your proposals and how to submit them. Um, and so please uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat um, and how we can help you. But essentially, I want to dedicate this time um, to talk about how you would be navigating to the page. And so essentially, once you visit the website at hispanicaccess.org slash trees, um, you will navigate to the bottom of the page and find a button that says click here to access the online grant application. Um, once you do, you'll be taken to another website that is where you will create an account where you will be able to start submitting your application um, and creating that username. We do ask that if there are any questions in submitting your app your application or proposal, if you will, um, for assistance on how to or any kind of assistance on there, we ask that you do contact us at trees at hispanicaccess.org. One of the tips um, that we do would like everyone to have or know is that there will be a downloadable version of the RFP. So feel free to review that before submitting your questions um, and taking a look at that um, so people can come together and be able to essentially answer those questions um, and prepare your answers um, for the RFP application, which you will definitely be able to save as you go, but it's just a little recommendation and piece. Uh, you'll also, um, as Marilyn mentioned, find a bunch of templates and resources um, that can help guide you uh, throughout the RFP process, um, but then also in the awarding. So um, the next question is, what are some key dates to remember? Um, and so part of that is that we are asking that applications be due by November 15th, 2024. Uh, we are expecting to announce awards by the winter 2024 to 2025 and have fully executed grant agreements by the winter of 2025. Um, and again, as we mentioned, those key uploads will be there to help you in the process and outlining the planning of your budgets or project plans. They are highly suggested to be used. Um, and to remember having these documents um, will be in preparation of submission um, of the of the deadline application deadline. Um, and so just to smooth over your application process. Um, and then again, if you do have any questions about these uploads, please feel free to reach out for clarification um, via that email. And I hope you found this helpful for you um, in preparing you and your applications. And so now um, we'd like to pass it back over to Glenda, um, who will be having or sharing um, any clarifications of questions. Um, so Glenda, um, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Naomi. Um, yes, I wanna encourage everyone to use the Q&A icon uh, at the bottom of the screen to put your questions in. And I do see a couple have come in. So what is ISA? That's a very good question. ISA stands for International Society of a bora culture. And um, what I can do is I can drop the link right here. That is a great resource to connect with um, certified ISA arborists in your community or close to your community that you can work with in terms of technical expertise when it comes to the trees that you're choosing, maybe even the areas that you're going to work in. So um, that was a great question. Let me go ahead and put the website right in here. Missing. Okay. So we also had a question saying, can we get this PowerPoint to share with our youth and their families? Yes, if you registered for the webinar, um, there will be a follow-up email that will have a link to this recording. And then let's see the next one we have, uh, goals of the grant on a summary. So uh, I don't know if not really quite sure what that one means. Um, we will have 
There are the three goals that we went over and you can find more information on the website about those. And then also this recording is gonna be sent again. So you'll be able to relook at those goals. I hope that answered the question. If not, feel free to, feel free to go ahead and um, put it in the chat if you need more clarification. Then we have a question here. Is there a limit on the number of applications per organization? Uh, yes, we encourage just one application per organization. Um, we want to make sure that we're providing, you know, equal access and review to to all different um, different organizations. So, if I'm if I'm understanding this correctly, this would be just one application to Hispanic access per organization. But if you're partnering with an organization that's also, and they're gonna be part of the grant, that would be one application. So it wouldn't be like they have to submit an, an application and then your organization has to. If you're doing it together, um, that's when it would be one application. So hopefully that answered that question as well. All right, um, we do have a good question here. Do you need a SAM.gov account? So when you apply, you don't need a SAM.gov account, but if you are awarded, um, we will be asking you to create that account. Um, you're gonna have to obtain a unique entity identifier. It's called a UEI. And so you would do that by registering at SAM.gov. And we would require that prior to the execution of the sub agreement. So if right now you don't have that, but you are, you anticipate that you would be able to get it if you were awarded, that is okay. Uh, Cutting, I think I, I think that to apply, I think that's probably asking to apply, you don't need the SAM.gov. Um, okay. Is winter 2025 around January 3rd? Yes, that's a, oh, that's a very good question. Um, is winter 2025 around January to February of 2025 or the end? So it would be early winter 2025. So that would be January, February, 2025. All right, so then we have another comment here that the audio um, didn't work for a little bit. Let me just see that. Okay, I think they're asking if the if the resources to execute the plan are if if you're supposed to have the resources before um, before doing the work and then and then we will reimburse you. So yes, yeah, so Amadis mentioned at the beginning of the or of the presentation that this is a cost reimbursement grant, which means that you would invoice us either on a monthly basis or quarterly basis um, for those reimbursements of funds. Um, in rare occasions, we might be able to work with you um, for a, you know, perhaps a, a, an advancement, but even that is um, quite a bit of paperwork. So, but we are really leaning towards a cost reimbursement type of um, grant here. All right, Veronica asked, is Hispanic access involved in evaluating the applications? Can we talk about the evaluation process? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, yes, Hispanic Access is involved in evaluating the applications. The US Forest Service, uh, in, you know, we are a pass-through organization. And so this part of the grant responsibilities does fall on us. And so in our evaluation process, um, we will be considering all different factors. And in our RFP, if you go to the website, you will be able to see how each question and answer is weighted and so we'll be using that system to, to help score the applications and determine you know, which applications are, are able to move on and which ones are not. Um, so I would encourage that if you have any more questions as you're writing your, your proposal or, um, or even thinking about it, you can reach out to trees at hispanicaccess.com or .org and we can help you with any of the questions that you have. Um, so be very thoughtful about that. You will have access in the RFP. You'll see the questions beforehand. And then once you start the application process, it's the same questions. 
All right, as a church, we don't have the knowledge, experience, or resources as other organizations. Will we still be considered? Yes, if you submit an application, you will absolutely be considered. Um, you know, this is, as Maite was explaining at the beginning of the, of the presentation, this, or, this opportunity is really meant to reach those communities and organizations that historically do not get funded. So while it might be a little bit overwhelming with all of the federal regulations that we've been talking about and some of those details, we really are focused on helping and trying to award projects um, to those communities and to those organizations that don't historically get funded. So please still apply, reach out to us if you have questions in the process. The next question is, are there any geographic limits on project scale and scope? Uh, no, we, well, outside, all projects have to take place within the United States, Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands. So that, that is the, the only really geographic limitation that you have. If you're gonna be working uh, with private lands um, or with public lands, you wanna make sure that you're including any of those individuals, whether it's the city and other, or private individuals in their yards, you wanna make sure that you're including them in the conversation and that you're obtaining um, letters of support so that they are aware that, or they're on board if you do choose to, if, if you would like part of their land to, to be part of the project. And then Milagro asked, is this a grant reimbursement base? Yes, yeah, for, yes, it is a reimbursement model. Um, is there a limit to the amount of money that an organization can apply? You can apply up to $1 million. Um, so the grant awards range from 50,000 to 1 million and anywhere in between. So if you do your project budget and you are you know, finding a number in between there, that is perfectly acceptable. All right, the next question is, would you have recommendations for other grants organizations can access to support reimbursement model? Reimbursement is very hard for small orgs. Um, yeah, because it, it could have helped building our capacity. Um, it, yeah, this is a, a resource that we're currently in the, in the process of trying to figure out um, with the, the reimbursement model is a tough one. And so we're trying to put together just some resources outside of Hispanic access that organizations can consider um, if this is gonna be a burden. And another reason that we put the $50,000 limit on there was for up to $50,000 was, or $50,000 as a minimum was to be able to help with organizations that don't have as many of those placeholders. So, um, so yeah, that should, hopefully that answers that question. The next one is, would you have, oh, I just, I think it just disappeared. Um, I'm trying to figure out, sorry, it's a little bit different here. Okay, um, so yes, this, I think Juan and Rocio are asking, if we are going to contact you and assign someone from our, um, our organization, or is this general assistance? So the, we do have a couple of resources. There's a community navigator program that Hispanic Access offers and also the community navigator program that, the, um, that is open to the United States. So there's other community navigator programs that can assist you in writing your grant application. As always, if there's a particular question, please feel free to reach out to trees at hispanicaccess.org. You know, we will field those questions and get back to you as well. All right, um, let me just see here. I have another question. If we apply for multiple pass-through funding opportunities like this from the USDA, and we are awarded multiple times, can we accept all awards or would we have to limit which we choose to accept? That's a very good question. Um, we do want to keep in mind that the, you know, the goal of equity with these funds. And so I, I can't necessarily answer this as a yes or no. Um, but I, what I would say is if you can put your email in the chat, we can get back to you with a more, um, solidified answer on that. Um, we do want to make sure that there is, you know, equity across the board. Um, but ultimately I can't necessarily answer yes or no on that one. That's a good question. Is our maximum organizational budget to apply? No, 
Um, if you're, you know, the budget, your organizational budget is um, not necessarily something that we'll be, you know, using to, to determine whether or not you can apply. So if, if you feel like you've got a healthy organizational budget and you have this, the ability to bring in more of these communities that historically have been underserved and you've got a good project that feel free to apply. Uh, Veronica is asking, are we have, planning to have another grant cycle in 2025? That's a great question. We are not. This is going to be, um, this is going to be a open RFP up until mid-November. Okay, but, but public parks, um, let me just make sure I'm gonna get this right here for translating. Can public parks and shelters be included in the project? Yes, uh, public parks and shelters can be included in the project. We encourage you to work with your local municipality to arrange that type of setting. You wanna make sure that you are connected with the right stakeholders in that um, and not just going in and, and starting a project without uh, the city knowing, we would also want to see a letter of support. The city is aware and on board with the project that you choose to, that you're wanting to implement. The next question is, what if the project is small? Can we request a smaller amount than 50K? That's a good question. Uh, we encourage you to ask for up to 50, ask for 50,000 at the bare minimum. Um, you know, you might want to consider there's many different eligible activities that you can uh, include in your, in your proposal. So you can get creative and, and maybe think, you know, that think bigger and, and think that, well, maybe what else can we include here that um, can reach up to $50,000. I think we're having a question answered here. I think we have, oh, I think it just, uh, just disappeared on me. But then the next one, ap apologies for that. Um, the next question is, uh, can you do, a, can you have a project with federal parks? That's a really good question. Um, I don't exactly have the answer on that. If you could drop your email in the chat, uh, we can go ahead and get that answered for you. Um, I don't wanna say yes or no on that necessarily. These are federal funds and IRA funds. And so we do wanna make sure that all of those parameters that were passed on to us are being implemented as, as we work as a pass-through. Um, so I don't have the answer to that right off the top of my head, but we can get back to you on that. Are art organizations able to apply as long as their projects meet the requirements? Yes, uh, if your organization meets the goals and requirements of this RFP, please go ahead and, and apply, absolutely. Can we in, so can we invoice for salary? How fast do you disperse funds? That's a great question. Yes, salaries are reimbursable. Salaries uh, for individuals and personnel that are working directly on the project are reimbursable. And once we receive an invoice and it is approved, you will receive that reimbursement of funds within 45 days. All right, and I think Maria de la... Luz Vera, she dropped her email here, so I'm hoping we can keep that noted. Um, the next question I see is, would having a match and a slash ability to leverage funds make our application more competitive? No, um, match is not required for this opportunity. We know that match has been harder for um, for those organizations that traditionally have not been funded. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't get more brownie points to say in this application. And then is there a limit on indirect costs? Uh, there, I believe there is a limit. I'd have to make sure that um, 
I get that correct. So if we can get your email, we'll also have some of that information in the RFP as well. I want to make sure that we quote you with the correct, if there is a correct limit on that. All right. So then we have Juan and Rosia who are sharing that um, in Las Vegas Valley, they have to adhere to planting plants that are already established in, in most cases. Yes, thank you for, for sharing that. All right, the next question is, what time on November 15th are applications due? We're gonna say 5, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Yes, fringe, uh, Raquel is asking, can fringe benefits be included in the, in the budget? Yes, you can account for fringe ben benefits in the budget. And then Maria de la Luz Vera is asking, is there a minimum or maximum for the salaries um, that they are looking to get reimbursed? No, there isn't. If, if you're able to show us um, you know, that the salaries are going towards personnel that are working directly in the project, you're able to, to show that cost and it's you know, whatever percentage amount of the entire budget, that is okay. Um, it's, you know, as long as we're seeing that the activities and the goals are all um, being accomplished. Then we have one more question here. Can awarded organizations pass through funds for reforestation projects in South America or only U.S. Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands? So we cannot um, pass fund. This is, we, we're not able to pass through funds for reforestation projects in South America. Um, and all awarded organizations um, through Hispanic Access are not allowed to sub-award. So that is one of the parameters um, of the grant as well. Great, I think. Oh, great. I think uh, I'm looking now at the webinar chat and our CFO was able to answer a couple questions. All right, I think that's the end of the questions in the queue of a Q and A. Okay, so I do have a couple trying to see here if there's more questions coming through. I think someone asked, are coastal sage scrub or native chaparral revegetation re options considered for this RFP? That's a uh, great question. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think so. I, um, I think we're looking mostly to trees um, for, this, for this RFP. And then the next one was native and or non-invasive state approved tree species are eligible. Yeah, so exactly. Native and or non-invasive state approved trees are was is eligible to be planted. And then I think uh, one last question is how long is the total project timeline? So we have up until, uh, it's about just a little le less than three years. So all projects would need to be completed by December 31st, 2028. All right, I think I think there's maybe one more question here. Um, is there a type of waiver for low income organizations or churches without a large budget? No, we, we don't have a waiver for that. We would just want you to um, answer the questions that are in the application and then uh, we would go from there. Got some more in the Q&A section here. Okay. What are the reporting requirements with this opportunity? So reporting, uh, there are two rep reporting requirements. Um, we're gonna have written narrative and financial reporting twice a year. So the first report would be due mid-July, then the next report would be due mid-January. So it would be twice a year. There is also a 
tool that the Forest Service is providing. It is an online tool that is called Survey123. And so we would be requiring um, participants in the program to upload information such as the number of trees planted, um, community events into this app as well. So there would be that reporting component and then also the written uh, reporting component as well. Um, okay, so Natalie's asking, so Hispanic access can fund projects in South America, but awarded organizations cannot, we cannot fund projects Am I, if I'm understanding essay correctly, we, we're not funding projects in South America, um, but awarded organizations cannot. So yes, we are not, a, the awarded organizations are unable to then disperse the funds again, they cannot sub-award. Um, hopefully that's clear now. And then Luke is asking, can the project scope be part of a larger project? Yes, absolutely. If, if this project is one component of a larger project, you can write that in your narrative. The only thing we do ask is that you keep those finances separate. Will the Hispanic, and then there is, will Hispanic Access Foundation have interest or capacity to do site visits to funded projects? Yes. We absolutely want to come and visit you on the ground, um, see the impact that you're having in your community. And so we will have um, in, a lot of interest and we will have the capacity to come to visits. Okay, and one more question is, if I'm a small organization or church with limited financial capacity, can I apply with the state or a larger partner to manage the grant and still be considered competitive? Yes, absolutely. You can partner with a larger organization, your municipality, um, as Amari said earlier in the presentation, to be able to apply and you'll still absolutely be considered competitive. And then we have another one. Can I propose new hires or added processes that would be implemented once awarded? And would that be considered competitive? Yeah, so if I'm understanding correctly, um, if you were to get this project and you knew you, that you needed a project coordinator, for example, on this team to be able to implement the project would be um, allowable, yes. And it would still consider you competitive. And then another one is asking, do you fund forest restore, restoration or management work? Yes. So that second goal, oh no, I think it was maybe the first, no, the second goal, um, tree planting and maintenance, you can go ahead um, and do forest, refor or forest restoration and management. That is included for existing trees. And one more question, can I submit my, pro my proposal in Spanish and can I submit reporting in Spanish? Absolutely. Um, you may write your proposal in Spanish. You can do all of your reporting in Spanish. And if you meet with us, you can speak in Spanish. So absolutely. Any, all right, I think. If that is um, if that is the end of the questions, um, oh, okay. There is one more question that's coming through. Um, if native trees are not conducive to the expected climate of the future, are non-native trees eligible? That is a great question and a real um, issue that is happening as we're experiencing climate change. Yes, non-native trees, so climate-friendly trees as approved by the state, are eligible. The only thing that we want to verify really is that you're not planting invasive species. Like that is really what we want to avoid here. Um, and so we will have in the RFP on the website links to resources that, that can link you and show you, um, get you to some information that can help you determine which types of trees are um, allowed in, in your area and which ones that can thrive and, and really make a good impact. 
All right, the next one is, will there be Spanish speaking reviewers or will my proposal be translated first? We will have Spanish speaking reviewers. Um, your, your proposal uh, might be translated for some um, people here at Hispanic Access, but we will have Spanish speaking reviewers, absolutely. Another question is, am I still eligible if I've applied for other urban forestry pass through opportunities? You are eligible, we are asking, um, we are asking if you have applied and, and the status on that, we are trying to be as equitable as possible. So we are working with the Forest Service and the other national pass-through agencies to ensure that we are getting these funds out to as many communities as possible. Is there a deadline to apply? Yes, the deadline is going to be November 15th, 5 p.m. Eastern. Anything else? Okay, so if there are no more questions, I'd like to um, pass it back to my colleague to close the, close the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Awesome, thank you so much, Glenda. Um, I'm so happy and impressed by all the questions that came in. Um, and so glad that everyone was able to have that opportunity to share. If you do still have pertaining questions or thoughts, please, please feel free to email us at trees at hispanicaccess.org. Um, I will be the face behind that email. Um, so please feel free to, you know, ask us questions on there um, and making sure that, you know, we want to make sure you're all well informed on what this impact is and what it means to us to be able to launch this for our communities. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar. Um, we appreciate your commitment um, to enhancing urban and community forestry efforts. Um, and so remembering that your contributions are important. Um, and if you do have other questions, please email us. Um, please head over to hispanicaccess.org forward slash trees uh, to see our RFP ready to go with its resources that we mentioned today. Um, please know that note that um, everything said during this webinar will be um, as part of follow up communications as a recording, as well as the presentation as uh, you know, y'all can see can have everything and it's accessible to you all. Um, and so we look forward to reviewing your applications um, and, with, and witnessing this positive um, impact of your projects. Um, and so thank you again, and I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Um, and I will give you back all 20 minutes of your time.